Hello there everyone, my name is Alex and today I'm going to be talking about computational modelling in political psychology. Now, computational modelling is a technique that uses mathematical models to explain and understand behaviour. This methodology is particularly useful for modelling how we expect participants to behave on certain tasks and also estimating their behaviour based on these models. So we can get a slightly finer grained understanding compared to just looking at behaviour um, averaged across a certain number of trials. So a few common behaviours that we usually model include react choices, so whether or not we choose stimulus A or B, reaction times, so how quickly someone reacts to something, or eye movement, so this can be gaze time or anti circadic movement. But as you can see from these examples, we typically model behaviours that are task-based, something that involves participants doing something. So something to be mindful of if you choose to look into this, this particular methodology is that it's particularly focused on behavioural paradigms. Now, what's important about these models as well is that they contain what is known as free parameters, which are values that can vary within and between participants. Now, these free parameters are, are aspects of the model that aren't set by the task necessarily, but are actually set by participants' behaviour. And these can be really informative in understanding the kind of mechanistic process behind some participants' behaviours. So there are some common uses of computational models, and this will largely depend on what you are investigating and the purposes of your particular study or research area. But I'm going to give an example now of some common uses of computational models that you see in the literature, but this is by no means exhaustive. So first we have simulation, which is where we can simulate task behaviour to generate predictions. So we can see, for example, how we would expect participants to behave on a task based on certain parameters that we can simulate. And I'm going to give an example of this shortly. Now, another is parameter estimation, and this refers to those three parameters I mentioned a moment ago. And by using parameter estimation, we can identify values that best explain behaviour for a given model. And this is really important because we can use these parameters to predict certain behaviours or identify individual differences or differences between conditions. And this can be informative for understanding certain things underlying behaviour. And then finally, we also have model comparison which is where we try to identify the model that best explains behaviour. And this is important in some research areas because there are many models that can explain a single task. And so by finding out which model best explains behaviour, we can get a finer grained understanding of that particular task. So today I'm only going to focus on simulation and parameter estimation. And to do this, I'm going to take an example from reinforcement learning. And now this is a relatively simple task called the two-arm bandit. And what you see here is two slot machines, which are otherwise known as bandits. The aim of the game is to try and collect as many points as possible. So each time I, I select one of the slot machines, I have a certain probability of getting a point, And each one will only give me one point at a time. Now, it's my goal or it's my aim to try and collect as many points as possible over the task, which requires me to learn the probabilities associated with each of these bandits or slot machines. So... There's an important part of learning that goes on here, and we'll talk more, a bit more about how we can do that later. And for the purposes of this example, I say I'm going to have two bandits or two slot machines, and I've got 100 trials to learn which one is the one that gives me the most points overall. And I'm going to set the probabilities on these bandits to have uh, a 75% chance of getting a reward in number one, and a 75% chance of getting a reward in number two. The equation you can see on the screen at the moment is known as the Rascola Wagner model, and it's a simple model that can help us explain how participants learn the probabilities associated with both of those slot machines in the N-arm bandit task. Now, for the purposes of this tutorial, the actual equation isn't so important, but just so everyone has a, a vague idea of what these things mean. So Q is the actual reward that participants have experienced. K is the particular bandit that they've chosen, so which of the slot machines that they've had, and T means trial. So on the furthest left here, we have the rewards that are expected from option K on trial plus one. And this is equal to the reward they just experienced on that previous bandit in the trial. And the alpha value that you can see there in green is a free parameter. So one of these parameters that can vary between participants. And this one in this case is known as learning rate. Now the learning rate alpha is how much emphasis participants place on recent trials. So to give an example of what this means, Say, for example, I was making my decision about whether or not I'm going to go out tomorrow. So I don't know what the weather's going to be like, but I need to estimate what the weather's going to be like based on the information that I have available to me, which doesn't include a phone or anything like that. So I've just got my observations of the weather. Now, if I have a really high alpha, a high learning rate, I'm going to place 
a really high emphasis on most recent events, i.e. what the weather was like today. And that would be all I used in order to make my decision about whether or not I'm going out tomorrow. On the other hand, if I had a slower learning rate, so I took into account less recent information, then I would actually take into account, for example, the week's weather before making my decision. And what this alpha value in this equation does is it modulates the degree to which I place emphasis on how different my last trial was to my expectation, which is known as prediction error. So RT is just the reward from the previous trial minus the, or sorry, the expected, RT is the expectation of the reward for that particular trial minus the actual reward that I experienced. So my, my actual rewards that were or weren't, were, were not gained. And this can vary very little or very much from what I expected. So I can code this with Scholar Wagner model to see how participants might behave in my task without actually having to collect a single participant's worth of data. So just remember, I've got one bandit or slot machine with a 75% chance of winning, and I've got one with a 25% chance of winning. And I'm gonna code two very extreme ends of the learning rate parameter. So I'm gonna code one example with a learning rate of 0.05, which is close to zero, and a learning rate of 0.95, which is close to one, where I'm weighing recent information really highly. So in the graph over here, we can see on the y-axis my expected probability of winning. So whether or not I think I'm gonna get a reward from the bandit or not. And on the x-axis, I've got the number of trials, which is just how many times I'm sampling that bandit. So in the blue line, you can see the learning rate that's at 0.95. So I'm placing lots of emphasis on those most recent trials. And you can see that when I when I only base my behavior based on the most recent trials, I actually vary a lot in my expectation about how I can actually do, how I can collect rewards from this bandit. And so I'm, I'm shifting a lot between expecting 100% of the time that I'm going to get a reward and almost zero time, um, zero percent chance of getting a reward from that bandit. Whereas in the other hand, you've also got the red line, which is where I've got a 0 0.05 um, learning rate, which is actually a lot slower. I'm integrating information across a range of trials. And as you can see here, when I integrate information from a wider range of trials, I slowly, slowly get, uh, get towards the actual true probability for that bandit. So in this case, having a slower learning rate is actually better in order, in order to estimate the true probability of winning from that bandit. And we can do this also for the other bandit as well, or with the 25% chance of winning. And again, in the blue line there, you can see when I'm only weighing the most recent trials for my particular task, I'm actually expecting the probability of winning to vary very, very dramatically and quite, dramatic and quite drastically. Whereas when I'm taking into account a lot more information, I gradually learn what the true probability is associated with that. And that can still vary a little bit, as you can see that red line does still vary, but I'm a lot closer than I am when I've got a really high learning rate. Now this might not seem important on the face of things, but if I was to suddenly look at my participants' data and see them vary a lot between my two bandits, I could reasonably infer that they probably have a high learning rate, and so they're jumping around a lot because they're really weighing that recent trial higher, and so therefore thinking that if I don't win immediately, it must mean that I've got a very low chance of winning on that bandit. Whereas participants who slowly learn the true probabilities are probably likely to have a lower learning rate and therefore be better able to estimate the true probability associated with each bandit or slot machine. So the Ruskola Wagner provides a really nice explanation of how participants learn to select the best option in a probabilistic reinforcement learning task. We typically say that simpler models should be preferred over more complex ones if they explain the data equally well. And the reason for this being that because we can generate so many models to explain behavior, we can often have a model that's really specific to a particular data set, but doesn't generalize well to others. So simpler models should be preferred if they can explain the data well. Now, once we've simulated our data, we should apply this, data, we should apply this model to our participants' data and estimate their free parameter in order to um, understand their behavior better. Now, the particular method of doing this, I'm afraid I don't have time to go into today, but there are some really nice tutorials that I'll, I'll highlight at the end of this session that people who are interested can look into. I'm now gonna give an example of where we've used this technique to better understand behaviors in context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we unfortunately know, the COVID-19 pandemic has been met with rapid policy changes from governments worldwide. And these policy changes have also meant that the population has had to adopt a new set of behaviors such as social distancing and adhering to nationwide lockdowns. So previous research in this reinforcement learning um, literature has demonstrated that weighing recent feedback higher, so having a higher learning rate, is associated with faster adaptions to changes in the environment. 
So the more I weigh recent information, the better able I am to adapt or incorporate these changes to the environment into my behavior. So we wanted to leverage this framework to understand whether or not weighing recent feedback higher would predict people being better able to adapt to the new social distancing measures during the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to test this, we used a foraging task, which meant that we needed to use a slightly different computational model. But the key thing here is that we still had that alpha parameter, which measured a participant's learning rate. And same as before, higher values on this alpha parameter mean that participants are weighing, putting more emphasis on recent information. So we asked participants to complete the task, and we ran this model over their behavior to estimate their alpha value. And we found that there was a large range of individual differences on how highly participants weighed that recent information. So we used this in a regression to predict how well participants were adhering to lockdown behaviors. And we found that consistent with our pre-registered pre predictions, higher values on this learning rate predict greater adherence to lockdown measures. And this is important because it supports rational models of decision making, i.e. that people are better able to adapt to their environment or changes in their environment with a higher learning rate. And it also applies this to a novel context, i.e. the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm now going to give an example of how this can apply to political psychology. So a recent paper has argued that cognitive rigidity during the Wisconsin card sorting test predicts ex um, extreme political ideologies. Now, the Wisconsin card sorting test you can see on the top right there is a card sorting test where you get a card that has an amb ambiguous category and you have to sort it according to one of the four categories. So I could say it either belongs to the red category, the category with two objects on it, or the category with the crosses. So each time I place this card in a category, I can receive either positive feedback telling me that I've got it in the correct category or negative feedback saying that I've got it in the incorrect category. And cognitive rigidity refers to my ability or inability to use that information to guide my behavior, to update my behavior and correctly sort the cards. And if I'm particularly rigid, I won't use that feedback at all. So it's recently been suggested that rigidity during the Wisconsin card sorting test is explained by learning rates for negative feedback. Now, this was a computational paper that didn't look at this in context of political psychology, but actually found that the degree to which people weighed negative feedback on that task, you know, how highly they weighed it according to their learning rate, actually predicted their behavior on this task. So I think there's an open question and a very important question to ask about how these computational parameters can predict political ideologies. And I think this is just one example of how these computational methodologies can be applied to political psychology. Just to end with some concluding remarks. So computational modeling affords us a greater insight into behavior than task performance alone. What computational modeling does is it allows us to estimate these parameters that aren't directly observable in participants' behavior, and it gives us a finer grained understanding of why their performance is as it is. As it is. And in some cases, this, this can afford us a mechanistic insight into participants' behavior. Simulating models can be really helpful for making predictions about how participants might behave, whether or not this is on a group or an individual basis. And finally, these cognitive parameters that we can estimate from participants' behaviour can help, help us to understand health behaviours and political views and can afford us a greater insight into these really important topics. I'm now going to recommend some reading, which I think for anyone that's interested can give a really good step-by-step -step introduction to this particular work. The third um, reference there is really interesting for making the link between political uh, psychology and computational modelling. And for a really hands-on tutorial, the Wilson Collins paper at the end gives a very step-by-step -step basis in terms of how to build, construct, test your own computational model. Thank you very much for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session later.